loving it. So we started on learning on uh, last week when we were remote, and it uh, it's, a, it's a cool topic, right? We we talked about um, classical conditioning on uh, last Thursday in particular. Remember, there's multiple kinds of learning, but ultimately, learning comes down to association. Okay, we come to associate things together. We connect things together. Uh, because as you were a kid growing up, on the table there was salt and there was pepper. Therefore, when you see salt, you think of pepper, right? Thoughts of salt lead to thoughts of pepper. John Locke and even Aristotle established these laws of association thousands of years ago. It's been around for a long time. Okay? So we we spent on um, Thursday talking about classical conditioning and, and when we laid this out, we said the classical condition was in some ways a passive form of learning. That, you know, it doesn't matter what the animal or the child is doing. I mean, learning just happens and things happen and it just is. So in Pavlov's basic study, we remember that at the beginning there's just stimuli. Neutral stimulus, it's just the sound of a bell, it doesn't really do nothing. I mean, I don't know, just, it is, it's a sound. So now, nothing happens. But then what happens is that there are unconditioned reflexes. Things that animals just know. If you put yummy dog food into this dog's mouth, this dog will salivate, okay? You don't have to learn it, it just is. That's the way the world is connected. Now, if you take, da -da ding 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 there it goes, and then out comes the dog food, yeah, he's going to salivate. Of course the dog's going to salivate. As we said that's an unlearned reflex, right? It just is. All we did is add this neutral stimulus to the front here. And during this time, which was called acquisition, this neutral stimulus, do this about five times, and it, it starts to gain value, right? It starts to gain condition strength. And so by the time you get through a handful of trials of acquisition, it's no longer called a neutral stimulus, but now it's called a conditioned stimulus, right? Condition means learn. And now the dog salivates in response. And the reason is because the dog here during acquisition has, has learned that when I hear this bell, something very important in my life is about to happen. Okay? Something that is a big deal to me is about to happen. Therefore, if I hear this bell, I ought to prepare myself, get myself ready. So the dog is starting to salivate to prepare itself for something important, right? That's a pretty big deal, right? I mean, if you can predict an important thing is going to happen, you'd be an idiot if you didn't get ready for it, okay? I mean, that, that would be stupid. And so that's really what's going on here. And so we, we looked at it and said, okay, classical conditioning and Pavlov, but we said, look at this chemotherapy drugs and waiting rooms. We find toilet flushing sounds and jumping, right? What? Yeah, all right, yeah, whatever. And even uh, <clears throat> somebody getting their freak on, all right? So we saw all kinds of different uh, classical condition associations. And in fact, one that I had, oh God, one time when I was young and stupid, I thought I could get the military to pay for my college. So I joined the military, okay? I went off to basic training at Fort Leonard Wood, Missouri. That place is a hell hole on earth, I must tell you. And one time we were out there with, they, and this is awesome, they give starving teenage boys, they don't give you enough to eat, they don't let you sleep, and they just criticize you all day long, and they punish you for everything, all right? And then they give us semi-automatic rifles. I'm surprised that there aren't more problems out there. I really am. Because those drill sergeants were not your best friend. And so uh, I shoot guns left-handed. I'm a left-handed shooter, but all guns in the military are designed for right-handed people. Okay? Which means that when you shoot the gun, the shells, which are white hot, I mean, they, they literally just exploded. The shells fly off across your face. Oh my God! One time it came out, and I'm wearing the you have you with the helmet on and the chin strap, and out it comes, and it lands right in there, and it melted my cheek. Okay, one trial. Okay, so neutral stimulus. Well, I've gone as a neutral. 
individual stimulus, but whatever. Pull trigger, blazing pain, all right? All he took was one time, and now every time you go to pull that trigger, what do you think the unconditioned response is? Ouch. Ouch, yeah. <laughs> you're going to have a little bit of a flinch, okay? And if you're shooting guns, I'm telling you, you know, you're 52. I mean, some of those targets were 200 yards down. And so you flinch this much, and it's got a trajectory that goes like that, right? That's just how it goes. So we had to hit, I think it was 22 out of 40 targets. I don't remember, because you go out to the target range, and up they, they pop up these targets, and I mean, you have to find them, and then they're gone. I mean, it, and it was as far as 200 yards for the furthest one. And I, I, I swear, I got like 15 the first time, they let me redo it, I got 18, I got 17, I went up there like five times, I got 21 one time. No, 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 no. And at the end of the, 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 the hardest thing I've ever done in my life, right, two and a half months of this torture, they're like, oh, you know what, here's the deal now. You go back home, because it was summer from college, right? Go back home, finish up your next year, but after that, you're going to have to do all your training back to back, therefore you're going to have to drop out of your junior year of college in order to complete this training. And I'm like, thank you, sir, thank you very much, sir. Got back to my home state and said, Fuck you. <laughs> Never went back. So that was my military experience. All right. That's they did not pay for my, but you know, works for some people. All right. So we find that not only do can can learned associations get acquired, but if you start playing that bell, then ding ding ding, and there ain't no food. Pretty soon you're going to extinguish that association, and the animals are going to stop responding. But remember, we said if you extinguish it and they stop responding and then put the dogs away and bring them back and play it a ding, 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 they start responding again. Okay? Spontaneous uh, recovery. And so clearly this is not the dog forgot that the bell predicts food. Okay? The, the dog simply said at this point in time, the, the bell no longer predicts food, therefore why should I prepare myself for food? But clearly, the dog did not forget that that was true. Huh? All right. So then we also talked about generalization and discrimination very briefly and saying, if the only thing you learned was incredibly specific, this sound leads to this outcome, you would have to learn every single thing on the planet separately. I mean, you have to be able to take the knowledge you already have and be able to apply it to other situations. What would be the point of, of learning if you had to learn every single doorknob, every single fruit, every single... It's like, you better take the knowledge you got from one place and apply it a little bit. So my little Haru. And then uh, Baby Albert is one of, the, one of the most famous studies in psychology, and we'll come back to Albert, I'm sure, at some point. So then we said a uh, second form of uh, learning is operant conditioning. Operant conditioning is much more active. That the person or animal involved is the one that actually, the behavior they exhibit determine the consequences that are occurring in their environment. Okay? And it all started with uh, Thorndike's cats and his puzzle box and that latency to escape. And he came up with this notion of the law of effect. The law of effect would, would take on a status that eventually was just called the one law of learning. Okay? That behavior is controlled by its consequences. If you, if you perform a behavior and good stuff happens, you're going to increase the number of times you do that behavior. If you perform a behavior and bad stuff happens, you will decrease the number of times you do that behavior. That's easy, right? Reinforcement and punishment. So, I showed you a couple of videos with the pigeons and the rats and the boxes. Okay. So now, when we talk about reinforcement, we mean uh, if something is a reinforcer, if, if I perform a behavior and I like the outcome. When I say reinforcement, it's I like the outcome. Because there's two different things that I like to have happen. In a, in a more uh, logical way, 
Give me a yummy candy bar and I will do that behavior again. Gotcha? However, negative reinforcement is the idea that if something is not good, then removing it is a good thing for you, right? It sucks. When I was a little kid, I got this joke record, you know, actual record. I don't know. Oh, I had a blue record player. It was awesome. And it was full of jokes. And, and my favorite one on there, I, and, and these, these guys are talking about this These are my favorite to play our shoes. Oh, really? Why? Are, you know, they're, they're four sizes too small. Oh, my God. Why are they your favorite shoes? Because they feel so good when I take them off. Okay? So, to a seven year old boy, that was the funniest damn thing I've ever heard. Okay? Gotta admit, it's a pretty good joke for a seven year old. So, the idea is reinforcement means good stuff. I like it. Positive does not necessarily mean good. This means good. This means to add. This means to take away. Okay? So in this sense, don't necessarily, because it, it, even though it's negative, it's a good thing, right? It's something you desire. So we desire these things, but these are adding something good, taking away something bad. Negative reinforcement, the easiest example is the idea of a seatbelt. Right, you know, you get in your car and it makes that sound. <laughs> oh my god, that is a horrible sound. So by the behavior of snapping the seatbelt removes that horrible sound. So what they're trying to do is increase the frequency of putting on the seatbelt. Make sense? Alright. So very good stuff. Punishment. If a behavior is followed by a punishment, then the frequency of that behavior goes down. Okay? And we can create a punishment in also two different ways. Positive punishment. That sounds a little bit weird, doesn't it? But it is to add. To add a spanking. Okay? To add something you do not like. We can negative punishment. Take away something you want. What? You stayed out after curfew? No more cell phone for you, young man. Sound familiar? Isn't that the go-to punishment now for, for parents? Taking away cell phones? Is it? You were just a perfect little gentleman. I didn't have a cell phone until I could pay for it myself. Damn, I need you at my back, okay? Because <laughs> every time I pull that one out, my wife will say, it's not the 1970s, you know. Because <laughs> somehow these kids think that it's my obligation to buy them a car. Oy. All right. So, you get the idea is positive means to add, negative means to take away, reinforcement is good stuff, punishment is bad stuff. Right? Things you like, things you don't like. Very cool. So you could also lay it out in kind of a, a way like this. And in fact, look at this. Ways to modify behavior. If you would like to make a behavior more frequent, okay, it is a good thing you would like to increase. You could add something positive to the environment or take away something bad from the environment. So these two techniques will make a behavior more frequent. Make sense? If you want to make a behavior less frequent, right? So the kid is coloring on the walls, bam, you got it. And what's the effect? Less frequently coloring on the walls. <laughs> okay. My wife thought it was so cute when my son was coloring on the walls. And I'm like, you know, this is a rental and we really, really, really need that security deposit back. It, it's not cute. It's just not cute. That was the apartment where they took away the security deposit and said they had to clean the carpets. There was zero carpets in the apartment. It was all hardwood. <laughs> and I'm like, are you sitting me? All right? You didn't even... Oh, So anyway, negative punishment. Right? Oh, you broke curfew. No cell phone. All right. And therefore. Well, it turns out that um, if you only look at simply these kinds of things, it, it's... It works well, but let's say, for example, you want to you want to teach an elephant to dance. Well, according to reinforcement theory, you wait till the elephant is dancing, and then you give it a banana, right? If a behavior is followed by a satisfying state of affair, then the frequency of that behavior will increase. Well, that's not going to work, dude, because you're going to be standing there for the rest of your life waiting for the damn thing to, to dance. Okay? 
So instead, what, what it's done is they use this thing called shaping. Okay? And what you're going to do is it, you got to be patient as hell. Okay? So you just stand there. And for whatever reason, you know, elephants just do stuff, right? So you just wait until the elephant lifts his foot off the ground. And you jam a banana in that elephant's mouth as soon as, as soon as he picks up his foot. Okay, okay. Wait, wait, wait. He's actually the foot comes. And guess what's going to happen after it's not very long is the elephant is going to associate lifting foot with yummy banana. And the elephant's going to be banana, banana, you know, pay me, pay me. What you then do is you then increase the, the requirements. Now it's not just lift your foot off the ground, but lift your foot off the ground more than one foot. Okay? It has to be up real high. And so, you know, the poor elf is like, what, what? You used to pay me for this. What's happening? And then eventually, because of there's all this variability, eventually they hit the one foot mark, banana. And pretty soon you got a, mo uh, a monkey. <laughs> An elf is just totally lifting its foot, weight, and you can get two feet, you can get onto the back feet, you can get standing up. So you have to just do it step by step by step, taking advantage of the fact that there is variability in an elephant's behaviors, right? That, you know, when they're, when, they're, when they're lifting their foot, sometimes they lift a little, sometimes they lift a lot. Be patient. Didn't we just watch that little video with B.F. Skinner make a pigeon go around in a circle? It's the exact same idea. There's variability. Pigeons are just doing all kinds of random crap. You wait until the pigeon is doing the thing that you would desire and just right, go for it. I had... Uh, some people in my in, in my master's program that uh, trained some rats to play basketball. All right, it was it was a pretty astonishing fact. Uh, it was very hard to do, but it involved picking up a ball, carrying it across the cage, and putting it into a little hole. It was cute. Okay, it was cute. Anyway, we find that um, when it comes to operant conditioning. People and animals learn things more complex than just behavior and consequences. They learn that in some situations, behaviors lead to different consequences. So one of my favorites was my daughter when she was about two. Just like all children, she loved to jump on the bed. Okay, you know, kids love jumping on the bed. My wife tries to reason with her and she tries to teach her the monkey song, you know, three little monkeys put it on the bed, right? And at the end of the thing, one falls off and has to go to the doctor, okay? Well, of course, my daughter learns this song and thinks this is a great jumping song, right? Three little monkeys. Okay, so here I am. I mean, I, I got my first stitches from jumping on the bed, so I have to, you know, I got to stop this behavior. You want to eliminate a behavior, you got to punish it, right? So I go in there. Joa, if you jump on the bed, you're going to get a meme. It's a Korean word for, you know, smacking the ass or something. And she goes, okay, okay, daddy, okay. Go, go, go. And so my daughter, she learned very, very, very specifically. I was a discriminatory stimulus. If dad in room, then behavior of jump on bed leads to punishment. If dad not in room, behavior of jumping on bed leads to fun. Okay, you see, you see what happened here? She used me as a discriminative stimulus to indicate which contingency was, was going to happen. Will this behavior lead to a punishment or a reinforcement? Depends if dad is present or not. Okay? Or in a more, um, more common way, you go to the vending machine. Behavior of putting money in machine leads to yummy candy bar. But if light that says machine broken is on, then behavior of putting money in machine leads to no money, right? So we, we learn lots of these. We, we learn consequences, but we also learn when it's true, okay? Uh, here, oh, here they use, this is awesome, they used uh, rats. In fact, with rats, what they have done is they've, Implanted, I, and I showed you a rat with an implant in their um, in their pleasure centers. And you can make rats do crazy things if you implant in their pleasure centers. And what they do is they hook up a rat with an electrode that sends a little jolt onto these pleasure centers, 
and then they can use a remote control and basically remotely make the rat do whatever they want to do. Okay, and so it's been used in in cases where there's been bombs or something, or uh, in this case, a bomb finding rat. It's it's if you've got rubble, they can get inside the rubble in a way that no mechanical device can ever possibly get into. And you can remotely control it with a little camera. I, they put a little camera on the, the rat's back. <laughs> it's, it's, it's pretty cute, actually. No, he's not wearing one. But you can remotely control it around and, and get, put it anywhere you want. In fact, in uh, right at the end of World War II, towards the end of World War II, B.S. Skinner was actually uh, called up to the military to, and, and this honestly was called Project Orcon. And uh, had the war gone on about one more year, it would have gone in place. And it was pigeons that were controlling missiles, okay? Because the Germans had been inventing the, you know, to block the signals so that you couldn't control it. And so they trained the pigeons to peck at a, that they would have a video monitor and they would peck at the monitor in order to get a missile to, to go where they needed it to be. That way they could never have a jammed signal because the pigeon was inside the missile. <laughs> it's a true story. It's a true story. Okay, when it comes to reinforcers, however, we find that primary reinforcers are those things that, you know, they take care of a biological need. We're talking food, drink, whatever that might be. A secondary reinforcer is a stack of cash. In and of itself, this has absolutely no value. None. All right? Why does it have value? Because of its association with a primary reinforcer. What about a third order reinforcer? A paycheck. A paycheck can be turned into cash. Cash can be turned into a yummy meal. Okay? So there are different types of reinforcers. Uh, yeah, yeah. once you've learned the skill of dollars in the vending machines, I go overseas and it's not really complicated to figure out their system, even though they're all different, right? Because it's close enough. I can generalize whatever I learned. Okay? Uh, I love this. This is actually my my doctoral dissertation is right here. Okay? This is this is my dissertation work. I literally and it, is it on that one? No, it's not that one. No, anyway. In my doctoral work, what I did working with pigeons and humans, believe it or not, was explore the mathematical equation to describe how reinforcement loses value with time. So, for example, I'm like, okay, we're all poor college students. So I'm like, I'm going to give you $100. And you're like, oh, my God, that's awesome. But I won't be with you for five years. Like, oh, shit. All right? As soon as a reinforcement is further in time, it automatically loses value. And so I actually studied this. Uh, the like, oh, it's a. I don't even. Oh, that's oh, it's you. Yeah. Uh, so it's one of these kinds of things where uh, this is time. This is value. I'm going to give you a hundred dollars in five years. If this was five years, this is. Right? But what about today? How do you feel about it? Uh, if you said I could have a hundred dollars in five years, you could give me about a dollar eighteen, and I would trade that away. You know what I mean? I would trade that promise away. And I could ask you at various points in time, how much money would you take to trade away that promise? And it would look just like that. Okay? And uh, so in my in my work, I was looking for the mathematical equation that best described this outcome. Okay? So it's a really, to me, fascinating, but to you, you're like, whatever, I'll tolerate it. But I, I absolutely love the mathematical laws of psychology. So all I can say is every time people th think, think it's stupid, I can say, PhD, buddy, all right? It got me a PhD, and I guess that's all that matters. Is it? So very cool. So um, the reason I study these delayed reinforcers is really in the uh, larger field of self-control, self-regulation. Because the act of self-control and self-regulation, what happens is you have to 
say no to a reinforcement at the moment in order to get a larger reinforcement in the future. Okay? So your you know your alarm rings in the morning, and you can have an immediate reinforcement. You can hit the snooze button and get another chunk of sleep. Or you can get out of bed, do the hard stuff so that you could get a better grade on your exam later. Which is better, you know, five minutes of extra sleep or a better exam score? I mean, duh, it's pretty straightforward. But which one is delayed in time? Okay? Because the exam score is delayed in time, it's subject to this gift penalty. Okay? So it's a, a fascinating way to help to understand human decision making and in particular why people fail so badly at making good choices. And that's really what all my work is about. So um, yeah. For offer and conditioning for most animals, what you have to do, it, 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 you have to have some immediacy, okay? Um, if your dog shits in the house and you don't punish him immediately, d don't punish him an hour later. That's just cruelty, okay? Because the dog has no way to connect the behavior of pooping on the floor with the punishment you just gave. It just does not know that, okay? So humans, on the other hand, because we are a little bit more cognitively sophisticated, can connect them in time, okay? However, if a child is too young, they cannot, okay? And so I, I, I don't know if you all watched like Leave it the Beaver before your time, but the old classic, you know, oh, the beaver, he does something naughty, and mom says, you just wait till your father comes home. So what they're saying is, look, this kid does a naughty behavior at noon and doesn't get punished until 6 p.m. Little children, that is too long, too long of a time between behavior and consequence for them to connect the two efficiently, okay? So much like your dog, that's just cruel, all right? So you got to be, I mean, mom's just got to man up and if you're going to smack the kid, mom, just smack the kid, okay? Don't wait until dad comes home. So, good stuff. Okay. Da, 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 da. And yeah, when I worked with my pigeons, oh my God, if, uh, it depends, and, you know, each pigeon was slightly different, but four seconds was about the maximum that you could have between behavior and consequence. If it was more than four seconds, it, I, I never was able to establish any connection at all. So, <sighs> different world. So, how about this? Do we need to give a reward every single time that the appropriate behavior is given? Continuous reinforcement is this idea every single time that a, or animal or child or whatever exhibits the, the desired behavior, you pay them. And so you're trying to teach your children good manners. So your child says, please, you give a reward to your kid. Great. Your child says, please, you give a reward. I got it. But I think it kind of defeats the purpose if you use continuous reinforcement on a child after a while, right? I mean, eventually you have to be like, dude, you have to go out into the world out there and you need to be polite, but I'm not going to be there giving you a cookie. All right? and you need to continue that behavior up there. So continuous reinforcement works very well to learn a new thing. Okay? However, once it has been established, if you then remove the reinforcement, the animal or child stops doing it. Right? Because why did I get it to get paid? Right? You stop paying me, I stop doing it. Right? It's pretty straightforward. However, Skinner explored all of these different partial reinforcement schedules, these different ways that uh, reinforcement should work in the real world. Okay, So in uh, his different rates, the fixed ratio schedule is similar to continuous reinforcement, but it's like, in fact, this is how they used to, to work factories, Okay, factories, piecework pay. So you're working in a factory and you're making widgets or some shit like that. Every widget you produce is one dollar. The faster you can produce widgets, the more money you make. Okay, you see how it's pretty straightforward? It's, what happens is when people are put onto a fixed ratio schedule, they just, their, their behavior, and animals and humans alike, 
It's just absolute rush, run, run, run. The faster I go, the more I get paid. And what happens is, um, in the United States, before some of the labor laws were put into place, factories would bring in workers, they would exploit the shit out of them with this kind of a system, and they would literally kill the workers. I mean, their joints would collapse. These people are 45 years old, 40 years old, and they have arthritis in ways that makes it impossible to work. And the factory says, all right, see you later. We got lots of people out there willing to take your place. Okay? And this still happens in other parts of the world, like China. This is exactly what happens, is there is actually no worker rights, and the factory gets paid, you know, factory makes more money. If we can make you move faster, this is what we're going to do. So labor laws in the United States have outlawed this type of uh, payment, payment, payment systems. Okay? All right. So a variable ratio is a type of reinforcement system that is somewhat in unpredictable. So instead of seeing a fixed ratio, it'd be like every five times, if, if we're talking like a rat in a skinner box, one, two, three, four, five, pay. One, two, three, four, five, pay. One, two, three, four, five, pay. Got it? But in a variable ratio, what happens is maybe on average it takes five responses to get paid, but it could be one and you get paid, it could be ten and you get paid. I don't know what it's going to be, all right? Maybe on average it's five, so who knows? And so what happens is that once you establish an animal on a variable schedule of reinforcement, all of a sudden the behavior does not extinguish, okay? Slot machine, oops, slot machines are really a great example of this, okay? You know, those slot machines are very much set on a, a they got it all worked out. They got it wor what's going to pay, what's not going to pay, but it's variable ratio. So sometimes when you're playing the slots, very first pull you win. Sometimes it takes 110 tries to win. Sometimes it's 50 tries to win. Sometimes you get somebody on a slot machine, you can unplug the damn machine and never pay again and people will keep putting their money in. All right, they'll just keep on playing, which is a desirable thing if you say, for example, using variable ratio to teach your child to say please and thank you. Okay, and this is in fact the job of a parent. You start using continuous reinforcement. Every single time your kid comes home with an A, you buy them Taco Bell or whatever it is they desire. Okay, my kids in Taco Bell. I don't know what it is. So then after a while, it's not every single time they bring in a name. Maybe once in a while I'll do it at random intervals, okay? So that the kid doesn't know. Because eventually, you want my child to not get A's because they get paid for them, but to get A's because it's the right thing to do. In other words, you want them to internalize that reward structure rather than having me, the external agent, in charge of it internalize it, they can do it. Okay? And this is exactly how the responses look. Okay? Here is time, and this is the number of times pressed in the bars. Right? Boom, 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 boom. You see this? It's just incredibly rapid. You see that? I mean, these, these dudes are in there, they're just flying. Boom. The faster they push the lever, the more they get paid. And both of these, really. Okay? In a fixed interval schedule, it's a it's a little odd to think of in, in terms of, of but uh, things such as uh, that you must wait a set amount of time before you can get reinforced. Okay? So you get a reinforcement, you must wait for in this example here, you, you picked up the mail, now you must wait one day to pick up the mail again. Right? Because what would be the point of going to the mailbox before one day has passed? And so what happens is the behavior of checking the mail will never be reinforced until 24 hours have passed. Gotcha? It just won't be. And so what you find in this kind of a fixed interval schedule is actually pretty interesting. In this case, you've got a, an FI 10 minute, I guess. So the animal has to wait 10 minutes between reinforcements. So here the animal gets paid. Okay, that's a little dash. It got some reinforcement. 
The animal now sits there and goes, okay, one minute has passed, they are not responding. Responses are if it goes off, right? If it's horizontal, that means nothing's happening. They just sit there, sit there, sit there. Somewhere around seven minutes has passed. You see what's going to happen? Well, I don't think it's been 10 minutes, but let me just check a little bit, all right? And so they're going to start to touch the lever. Eight minutes have passed. They're starting to really get involved. Nine minutes have passed. They're starting to get pretty frantic on here. And so as you get closer and closer and closer to 10 minutes, the rate of their responding goes up, 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 and then it pauses again. So that, a nice little pause after each and every one. That's cool. Variable interval is like um, a schedule of reinforcement that is unpredictable in its amount of time. One, in fact, when I was in uh, my master's degree, we had this... Uh, it was a little bit, a little bit, the same idea. That uh, we had an animal colony there, a uh, rat colony, and uh, the U.S. Department of Agriculture would come out and do inspections five times a year. But it wasn't; they didn't tell you when it was going to happen. Okay, and you know it's going to be five times in a calendar year, but it could be, you know, they 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 could show up two days in a row. Okay, it's just going to be five across the year. And because it's so unpredictable like this, you know it's on average, well, I guess six times a year, we'll say, yeah. you know on average every two months. Okay, that's straightforward. It's a two month thing. But you don't exactly know is it going to be a week? Is it going to be three months? Is it going to be. So you always got to be ready. Got it? You always have, in this case, what it meant was you had to have the animal lab spotless. Because if the USDA inspector came in and you didn't have a clean lab, they were going to pull your license, all right? They were just going to take it away. So, same idea, you know, unpredictable quizzes or something like that. So, yep, the, the variable interval has just got slow and steady responding. Yeah. So, we got frantically fast responding, slow and steady responding, intermittent responding. I like it. So, punishment, okay? We as a society have a big problem here. Because in the same way that the delay to a reinforcement influences how much it's worth to you, delay to a punishment also changes with time. Oh, you're going to receive a terrible punishment, but it won't happen for one year. Oh, what's that? That doesn't mean anything. So let's say, if I get caught drunk driving, I'm going to have to have all of these punishments but they won't happen until one year after this behavior. Okay, you see the problem here? And so, I, I mean, it sounds terrible, but punishment should be given immediately after, or it just doesn't work. It just doesn't. And our justice system obviously is not designed this way. It's absolutely not designed to do that. So anyway, we find that uh, Skinner himself had a big problem with using positive punishment. He felt that when you raise your child, you should never use positive punishment. Because what happens when you use positive punishment, like to add a spanking or something like that, is you are, number one, you're producing anxiety or anger in the child. Okay? You find that you are negatively reinforcing the parent. That is, the child has frustrated you as a parent. You have an incredible amount of frustration built up. Wacko on the child, and guess what? You are administering positive punishment to the child and negative reinforcement to the parent. You see what I'm getting at here? So, punishment should never feel good to the parent. And that's sometimes what I'm telling you. I'm, I teach child psych, and in there I'll tell you the skinny on how child children work. Right? They are frustrating little bastards. And yeah, they're frustrating. You're all frustrated, and I could feel better if I But also, we're going to talk a little bit about um, social modeling or social learning here before class is over. And the children are watching you, and they're saying, okay, so when you're frustrated, the appropriate response is physical violence. Hmm, interesting. You've taught me an interesting lesson, Dad. Okay, can you see the problem here? They're learning all kinds of crazy crap in there. Okay. 
So, uh, here, without getting into a lot of detail, uh, we find that just because an animal is not exhibiting a behavior does not mean they do not know how to exhibit a behavior. So, um, imagine the first, okay, you were a little kid and you were driving in a car, riding in a car, riding in a car. You never actually perform the act of driving yourself. So the first time you sit behind the steering wheel, do you have to start from scratch? No, you had all kinds of elements of that task already built up, didn't you? So even though you had never exhibited the act of driving, you had built up a, a knowledge base of how driving works. Okay? And so this notion is that we learn even when we don't physically change our behavior. We don't even have to have rewards and punishments. Okay? Anyway, he was going. Uh, different applications. School. Yeah, B.S. Skinner proposed machines. He actually, I'm impressed, he basically predicted um, so much of our modern educational system where uh, you put children into learning environments where they answer questions and then they get reinforcements from the computer. I mean, y'all do these things and they'll give you prizes and now you can add to your avatar. You know what I'm talking about, right? If you accomplish these tasks and you get, you're looking at me like you've never played one of these kinds of games. <laughs> never. If you add 5 plus 2 correctly, then you get a point for the Circus Carnival Prize, right? Yeah. Uh, it was Rita Rabbit. Nobody had Rita Rabbit growing up? I did. Yeah. You had Rita Rabbit? Uh, my, my kids had Rita Rabbit all over. Rita Rabbit. In sports, absolutely. Um, you find that uh, you need to modify your behavior to get your reinforcements, right? In work, uh, absolutely you need to look at how to, well in a work environment, actually this is, this is pretty interesting, is that uh, it points out that not all people are reinforced by the same stuff, okay? And so if you're, if you're a manager, you have to identify what it is that is important to each and every worker. Some workers respond well to money. That's the only thing they want is a raise. Some of them, all they want is recognition. For some employees, you can create an, an incredible motivation just by putting up a stupid little picture that says employee of the week, okay? For some, it's good parking spots. For some, it's flexible scheduling. So you have to figure out what is it that people desire before you can even start to think about a reinforcement system, huh? What's your, you're thinking something there, aren't you? No, I'm yawning. Oh, okay. <laughs> you're thinking on his own. Oh, oh. All right. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Reward small improvements towards the desired behavior. Don't expect complete success at the beginning. Okay. Um, yada, yada, yada. Blah, blah, blah. This is one of my favorites, operant conditioning. This is a, a potty chair that I found when my daughter was about this age. And, uh, on this potty chair, it's a throne of their own. See, it comes with a storybook too. You know, you're the king. So what happens is that when a child sits on the potty chair, you can see a little button back there, that that triggers a, a song, you know, da 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 da. All right, so that's awesome, you know. You're the king, buddy. And so look at this. Reward small improvement toward desired behaviors. Yeah, okay, we're going to reward the act of sitting down on the potty first, okay? Then it turns out that inside of there they got a little detector so that something enters the bowl, it gives another reward, like da 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 <laughs> right? Can you imagine that? <laughs> Pretty good rewards, right? And so they're trying to use a two-step reinforcement system to reinforce the act of number one, sitting down, number two, depositing in the potty. Positing the party. Um, but what was fascinating was I read the uh, reviews for the product, the online reviews, and there were some, some women and uh, mothers. And I, I guess I'm sexist. I'm assuming they were mothers the way they were written. But uh, one of them said, I had to take the batteries out because my kid just hated the sound. She was scared by it. Okay? So instead of acting as a reinforcer for one girl, it acted as a, a punisher. Okay, okay. Another one wrote, all right, this is all lovely and everything, but my daughter has figured out 
that it doesn't have to be um, poopy in the potty that makes it go off. She can use her hand. She can jam her hand in there and get the reinforcement. So, I'm not sure if that was before or after potty, but I thought it was a beautiful use of operant conditioning to successfully shape a complex behavior. Uh, yeah, yeah. Okay. And so here I want to connect back a second because here was what I had originally gave you this example with classical conditioning. Okay. If the water gets really, really hot, you jump and scream. If you hear a toilet flushing sound, which is a neutral stimulus, and all of a sudden the shower gets incredibly hot, you jump and scream. And pretty soon, the sound of the toilet flush leads to jumping and screaming. And this was our classical conditioning example. But the fact is, I would be an idiot if this was true. Instead, this is a discriminative stimulus for me. This now allows me to know something. I can be active. Do you know what I can do? When I hear the toilet flush, wham, hit the shower head so that it does not, in fact, hit me. Why would I get burned if I can perform a behavior to avoid being burned? And so the condition stimulus from classical conditioning became the discriminative stimulus for this behavior. Okay? Pretty cool, huh? Somehow I think it's more cool than you might think it's cool. All right. So, yeah. Oh, this is great. They used, uh, Breland and Breland were, they, they were animal trainers, and they had a lot of different, but my favorite one was they were trying to train a, a chicken, okay, for a television commercial. So they got this chicken, and the chicken marches out on stage, turns and faces the audience, and stands proudly. That's it. That's all they wanted this chicken to do. We don't, we don't have high expectations. So they got this chicken going, and it's, it's perfect. It's got it worked out. And then... Finally, they're ready for the camera, and the chicken comes out, turns, stands, and then starts scratching the floor. You're like, dude, no! I just want you to stand still. What are you doing? The chicken has associated this activity with food. And scratching the foot is a food behavior, isn't it? That's what chickens do. Y'all don't live on farms. That's what chickens do, okay? And so all of a sudden, what's happening is that we can do our damnedest, but I mean, a chicken's a chicken, a pig's a pig, all right? You can't, you can't pretend they're not. And so animals have certain things, like say, for example, it is very easy to teach a pigeon, for example, um, when a loud sound comes on, fly away from the sound. Very easy. Try to teach a pigeon this. When a loud sound comes on, fly towards the sound. It isn't going to happen. You're just not going to be able to, to train that behavior. It doesn't matter what you have, okay? So animals come in with their, their predispositions. But perhaps, in my opinion, the most interesting form is observational learning, okay? Because with both classical and operant conditioning, the learning that you can have is limited to the experiences you have, okay? How about this? Your stupid little brother put his hand on the hot stove and screamed. You ought to take that and go, though I have not in fact experienced that consequence, I will assume that if I put my hand on the stove, it also will hurt. You gotcha? Why wouldn't you benefit from that experience? It doesn't have to be you experiencing the consequences to learn from it. And that's what modeling or social learning is all about. Okay? we find that if you take this notion even further, your mama can say, if you put your hand on the stove, you're going to get burned. You're like, okay, cool. I learned from that nobody had to get burned, nobody had to suffer the consequences, and I learned that contingency. Okay, that's pretty powerful. That's, that's pretty good stuff right there. So, observation and learning. Oh, yeah. Uh, observational, yeah. Okay, the classic work in observational learning came from Albert Bandura. What he did is he creates this, this movie, a video. And in this movie, he's got this woman, and she goes into this room, 
And you see what she does is there's this thing they call a bobo doll. Anybody ever have a, one of these kinds of toys? They got like sand in the bottom to weight them. So you punch them in the face and then they pop back up. I had a goofy one. You know, goofy deserves to be punched in the face. You know what I mean? <laughs> Just begging. Please punch me. So the kids, what, they, what he does now is he brings them in to a laboratory and he uh, puts them in a room full of really good toys. I'm talking the best toys on the planet. And they're in there for like a minute or less. And then he says, oh man, I gotta save these toys for some other kids. You have to go to this room. And it's filled with crap toys, okay? So you frustrated these children. You got that? I mean, they are annoyed right now. You just took away the best toys in the room. So in this new room, they happen to have this bobo doll. Okay, so the kids watch a movie, they get frustrated, then they go in a room with a bobo doll, and you see what they did? Sits on it, punches it in the nose, throws it across the room, hits it in the face with a hammer, kicks it, etc. And in fact, this woman in the video, she even said something like, pow, punch him in the nose, something like that. Guess what she says? Pow, punch him in the nose. So she's not only imitating the adult's behavior, but I mean literally replicating the word for word what she said. Okay? So this is a, a pretty big deal. Now in other versions, he did so many different versions. In some of these things, at the end of this video, right, she beats up this bubble doll, and then at the end, she's either rewarded or punished. Okay? So at the end of the video, you know, somebody will come out. This was done in 1962 or something. So comes out and gives her 7-Up and Cracker Jacks and calls her a strong champion. You are a strong champion. Here, take this nourishment. Okay. I'm not even kidding you. I've read the original source material. If, and then in the version where she's punished after beating up on the Bobo doll, somebody comes up with a rolled up newspaper and, how dare you pick on that doll, you big, big meanie, and spanks her with the newspaper. Okay. So now, children number one, if they just observe the behavior, they imitate the behavior, okay? Observe, imitate, got it. But if they observe her being reinforced for this behavior, they do more of it. If they observe her being punished for it, they do less of it, okay? So it's a pretty clear idea that children are not just watching adults and imitating them, but they're watching them and going, what consequence ha happened to the adult? And I predict that that is a consequence that's going to happen to me. Okay? So he did a lot of different versions of this. He found um, that children, you know, they don't just, some observers work, or some, some models work better than others. That is to say, if it is a woman imitating the behavior, girls will do it more. If it's a man imitating, boys will do it more. So it's a, a pretty important idea is that children do not just imitate anyone. They, they clearly, in fact, they have even identified um, in the classrooms, they go down like second grade classes, and they identify which kid is the popular kid. And then it turns out whoever's the popular kid, then you find all the other kids imitate that kid, right? Not, not every kid. And so... Um, I have a, a really a, a rant that I go on about this. It, that is that um, the boys in America are getting screwed over. Because what happens is kids need role models. Kids need somebody to look up to. And uh, what happens is that we have a lot of single parent families. And in most of these, it's, it's the mom, right? Most of them. And meanwhile, when they go to school, you know, you know who girls look up to as a role model most often is their teacher. There are no male teachers. There are just aren't in you know, second, third, fourth grade. I mean, when my kid was in grade school, there was one male in the school, the principal. That's it. There was no male at any level up until what? Seventh, eighth grade? These kids are growing up with ro no role models. There are none. Do you know what kids are doing, boys? They need to find a role model. So they often look to professional sports athletes, because those are the ones that society has, in fact, rewarded. So I get very bothered when I see professional athletes that act like dumbasses, okay? Des Bryant comes to mind, okay? But they act like dumbasses, 
and the the boy the boys in our country they don't have a role model. That's who they're looking to. That's what they're seeing. They're saying, look at this. Society rewards him. Society glamorizes him. And these are the behaviors he exhibits. If she was rewarded, they do it more. Okay, you see what's going on here. So we as a society really are failing our, our male children. They're just, they don't have that positive role model to look to. They don't. So here is a really cool experiment. I, I actually got to do some of this stuff too. We used um, mashed potatoes, actually, uh, powdered mashed potatoes. And then you make different flavors, right? Peppermint flavor, cinnamon flavor, cocoa flavor, mashed potatoes. And so what you're going to do here, you're going to take a rat. Okay, you've got two rats together. So here you're going to take this rat and give it cinnamon flavored mashed potatoes. Then what you're going to do is take that rat and you're going to make him sick. You're going to give him an injection of lithium chloride, I think it is. Make him ill. Okay? Number one, this rat, if given the opportunity, won't touch cinnamon again, right? Because I ate cinnamon and then I was sick. I'm never gonna, it's called the taste aversion. That's classical conditioning. However, dude ate cinnamon. Now they come back, and guess what happens? This rat looks and goes, okay, this dude is sick right now, and I smell that guy's breath. Cinnamon. So this rat that has never eaten cinnamon before in its life will not touch it. Okay, you see that? They're observing this other rat is sick. They smell like this thing. I ain't touching it. This is uh, one of the reasons why it's so hard to kill rats. Oh my God. I mean, even if you manage to kill this rat, okay, they can still smell exactly what the last thing he ate and ain't going to touch it. So uh, it's a rough world out there. Well, it turns out that, that uh, observational learning or modeling or social learning, whatever you're going to call it, has some roots in the brain. It turns out that uh, in the brain, there's this area that's called the mirror neuron system. And they discovered it by accident with monkeys. Okay? They were trying to map out a monkey's brain. And so they had a scanner on, and they would have the monkey do this and the monkey do that. If the monkey does this, what activates? You know, pretty standard stuff. And then they had it set up so that they would put away the monkey and then they would clean up for the day. Okay? Well, one day they did it opposite. They, the monkey was still hooked up to the machine and they started to clean up. So they reached for the, you know, the, the banana on the table or something. And the monkey's brain activated in a way that was almost exactly the same when the monkey itself grabbed the banana. It's like, wait a minute, wait a minute, what is this saying? They call it the mirror neuron system. It's an area of your brain that activates when you watch others performing a behavior. It's what allows us to learn from others. Now, all animals have a mirror neuron system, but it turns out that human beings, right, it's like, here's a cat's mirror neurons, here's a dog mirror neurons, here's a chimpanzee's mirror neurons, here's a human's, right? So all animals have them, but it's just like a mile apart. We are just... This is one of the things that truly makes us human, is this, this, this portion of our brain. So as you can see right here, if I physically zap you with electricity, <laughs> this is pain. I'm going to take somebody you love and you watch them get zapped with electricity. This is empathy. So we can see some pretty big overlap between these behaviors, one, one which affects you and one that you're just watching. Huh? Here is a, an example of how the mirror neuron system would, would work. So, and this is just how babies work, okay? Check this out. They're looking at each other, making googly eyes. The adult turns, the baby turns, okay? Wow. You know how we, all right, we're going to get to developmental psychology later. But when a baby is born, I mean, every single thing is brand new to this baby. Everything. How does the baby know what's important? Which ones are worth studying? Which ones are worth learning about? Which ones can I ignore? How the hell is the baby supposed to know? Well, guess what? If a grown-up is looking at it, that probably means it's something important. So you see what happens is this simple act right here has focused the baby's attention on those things in your world that are important. Wow, that's a, that's a big deal, right? Don't, Waste your time on garbage.
Well, it turns out children with autism seem to be lacking a mirror neuron system. And they just they wouldn't do this. A child with autism would not do this. One of the, like say for example, I, I could say to you, okay, I'm gonna give you a list of nouns. You tell me which one is doesn't belong. And I'm gonna be like, apple, table, window, car, human, rug, you know, and you're like, well, human, right? Human is somehow different from this other collection of nouns. But see, a child with autism would not see a human as somehow different from another collection of nouns. They're not in any way, shape, or form special. And it is this mirror neuron system that makes that happen. So we find that children with autism uh, don't, don't, don't uh, learn emotions in the same way that a uh, child without autism does. And you have to in literally teach uh, emotions on flashcards. We'll see that one some other day. So we find that observational learning is, well, I, I, I want to, again, I'll do, I'll do child development later. But as a parent, I'm going to tell you a, a lesson. Your children are always watching you, always. You think that they're not watching. They are always watching you. You're in the car having a conversation. They are always listening. You never get a day off. You are. You must be the role model 24 hours a day. Uh, yeah. So we find that um, the media often is uh, given a bad rap because what they're doing is given giving bad role models to children. And um, it, it, the fact is, the majority of the most popular movies that are out there involve killing, murder, and violence. They, they do. I, I, can you, uh, how popular is a movie where you know people just make friends with each other? Oh, let's just be friends. Oh, okay, that's going to be a blockbuster hit. No, it's not, okay? It doesn't involve somebody shooting somebody. Nobody's going to pay for the ticket. Well, it turns out that um, Sesame Street was designed specifically because of this. The reason Sesame Street exists is because there's so much of this out there in the media, they wanted to make a place where children would have a positive model to observe. All right? That is exactly why Sesame Street occurs. Okay? So it can be bad or good or bad. Okay? It's pretty clear that uh, there is a connection here. Hours of television watching per day at age 14. So certain kids have lots of television watching. Percent committing aggressive acts. Look at that. Males that watch a lot of television. I mean, this is an old one. I'm sure it would be other forms of media as well. But, you know, leave it alone. I like this one. An octopus, all right, at a zoo has uh, learned how to open jars of shrimp by watching a zoo attendant. So they feed the jar, they, they open, you know, the divers go down, they open the jar, they, the shrimp go to, they ate them. And now when they put the jar in there, the uh, octopi, octopus, because it's only one, uh, opens the jar. That's pretty damn smart, isn't it? But, <coughs> In the wild, what do you think is a favorite food of an octopus? Shellfish. Okay. And guess how an octopus opens a shellfish? Over the top, tentacles down, twist. You twist open a shellfish, don't you? How do you open a jar? <laughs> you twist open a jar. So I don't know. I mean, I love the, st I love the story, but I'm a little skeptical, okay? I don't know. But these things are pretty, octopuses are pretty damn smart. I'll tell you, I've seen some pretty amazing stuff on them. Well, here is actually pretty cool too, because social learning is just part of, of a larger kind of an idea. So in this aquarium, there's a bunch of killer whales. And uh, one killer whale, and we, have, we, we don't know exactly how it happened, so we'd have to imagine at the beginning. So what happens is, you know, you feed the whale, the whale is full, ate its dinner. You know, after eating a nice full dinner, you get a little indigestion, <clears throat> up goes your fish. Can you imagine a bird comes down to get the fish that's floating on the top at the exact same moment that the killer whale is going to get its fish back, okay? 
catches a catches a bird. And so this is operant conditioning, right? And pretty soon this whale is just like, Bleh. wait, grab the bird. Bleh. Wait, grab the bird. So it's catching all of the seagulls. Now what's really pretty cool is that pretty soon this whale's brother is also doing this. Pretty soon, his cousin is doing it too. Pretty soon, every single whale in the aquarium is performing this behavior. Okay? Go down the road, and there's another aquarium. Zero whales do this. Zero. So observational learning allows for cultural differences. Why is it in one culture we use forks, and in another culture they use chopsticks? Observational learning. Okay? They watch the people around them. They now have a culture which is different from our own. I like that. So it turns out that observational learning can be used for a lot more than just very specific behaviors. General patterns can be taught as well. Personality traits, problem solving. Look at this little kid solving a problem. That's awesome. Okay. My favorite one was actually in a, they had this bowling game. Right? This game, in, you, you throw a puck on a, on a field and you knock over these kids. And so you can get a score ranging from 0 to 20. So now some adults, they're going to demonstrate playing this game. They're going to play this game and they're going to have two different conditions. In one condition, every single time they play the game, no matter what their score is, they, they eat some M&Ms in the bowl that's next to them. A different group, they model a higher standard. Okay. It's like, if they score less than 12, they do not take any M&Ms and they make it explicitly clear, I should only reward myself when I have good behavior, okay? And only if they score high do they take the M&Ms. Then they let the kids play, they read the M&Ms, don't tell them anything about the M&Ms, and the children play the game and reward themselves exactly the same way that the adults did. So if the adult demonstrated a high standard for self-reinforcement, the children also uh, exhibited a high standard for, so it's way more than just really specific things. It can be general patterns that they're picking up, okay? Kids are smarter than they look. Okay, so that's what we got on the, uh, the learning today. Now, I believe we're gonna do memory next. Oh, I don't know. Probably. Feels about right. So anyway, one of my favorites here, obviously. So anything at all? No. Whatever. Okay. Then I will see y'all on Thursday, and we will do whatever it says on the syllabus. And I'll bet you.